tonight. We are uh, at 10.01. We always start on time. Um, so while still people are coming into the meeting room, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome today Professor Jennifer uh, Broadbelt uh, at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and Dr. Broadbelt has an undergrad degree from the University of Virginia and earned a PhD from Purdue University, where she worked on gas phase ion chemistry using mass spectrometry. Following her PhD, she was a postdoc at the University of California at Santa Barbara before joining the University of uh, Texas at Austin in 1989. Um, she was president of the American Society for Mass Spec for the period of 2014 to 2016. Thank you for your service, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> and as of 2016, she is the Roland Petit Centennial Chair in the Department of Chemistry. Um, so she really works on development of mass spec based methods to characterize organic molecules, um, you know, used chemical analyzation, ion traps, and uh, get, uh, looks frequently on gas phase ion chemistry. Um, she does, of course, also work on proteins, but today she will tell us about something that we are very excited about. <laughs> Um, that's lipids, um, and lipids have double bonds, and we want to know where those double bonds are. And uh, that's what we're going to hear today, but most likely. Um, and she will give us a, her seminar about new frontiers in uh, ultraviolet photo dissociation mass spec of lipidomics. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yep, we see everything fine. Okay, great. Uh, so um, I thank you for that nice introduction, Oliver. I'm very delighted to uh, share this seminar. As I mentioned, it is a, a new seminar for me, so we'll see how it goes. I might have to uh, cut a few things in places, um, but I'm very excited to give this seminar because, in fact, usually I do talk about proteins and top-down uh, uh, proteomics, so uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to switch gears and talk about lipids and add some new material in, and so that's what I'll cover today. Uh, but to, to set, us, set it off, let me um, clarify that really my training and, and core interest is mass spectrometry. So really, I view myself as an analytical chemist uh, developing mass spectrometry to solve complex problems. And I'm going to speak about lipids, but I'm not a lipid specialist, nor am I a biochemist or a biologist. So uh, for those who are dying to ask uh, really critical fundamental mechanistic questions about lipids and disease. Uh, I might fall short, uh, but I can cover um, ultraviolet photo dissociation pretty well. So in any case, I'm very excited to share this seminar, and I am going to focus on the technique that we've been developing for uh, almost a decade called ultraviolet photo dissociation. And this is uh, a method of tandem mass spectrometry and most of you are familiar with um, MSMS methods, and most of you use some sort of collisional activation method, uh, which are by far the most popular and robust methods. Uh, but we ventured into a different area using a laser to activate uh, ions. Now, this is not the front end MALDI type um, use of a laser. This is where we've modified our mass spectrometers at the back end to add a laser to perform um, energization and fragmentation. And so today I'm gonna to share an overview of how we can use ultraviolet photo dissociation uh, to decipher many structural details about lipids. And many of us are already familiar with some of the hurdles associated with analyzing lipids because they span such a diverse variety of structural types and they contribute to enormous variety of biological functions. And so characterizing these types of molecules is uh, certainly a great challenge. And um, I don't need to you know, emphasize that with these lipids, you know, if we look at phospholipids, for example, uh, understanding the acyl chain positions, the locations of unsaturations, the stereochemistry of that unsaturation and modifications that might occur to head groups are all things that complicate um, the structural characterization. And so the first part I'm gonna focus on glycerophospholipids, and we know these are super important in how they modulate membrane structure and serve as sing signaling molecules and uh, important for maintaining protein structures. And in fact, uh, now these are well recognized as uh, biomarkers in uh, disease states. And so 
Uh, I'm going to first focus on some, uh, you know, more common um, got, uh, uh, glycerophospholipids. And then towards the end of my talk, I'll talk about some of the most challenging ones that have uh, four acyl chains, uh, cardiolipins. And so the, the details that we're trying to decipher uh, include uh, the fatty acid chain compositions, uh, the head groups, and any modifications of those um, that might you know, be overlooked. Even addition of hydroxyl groups can really play a role in function and, and uh, mechanisms. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on how we can uh, localize double bonds and this has historically been uh, difficult by using conventional collisional activation methods. Uh, so that's uh, something that we uh, targeted as a, a puzzle to solve. And we thought um, an alternative MSMS method uh, might uh, solve that uh, question. And uh, so we know that um, lipids can be classified and characterized in many different levels. And even just using high resolution mass spectrometry will often give you the sum composition of a particular phospholipid. Uh, using tandem mass spectrometry will often give you more of a molecular type structure, but really if we're trying to get to double bond um, localization level, that's where we're gonna need specialized tools. And um, as I've mentioned here, um, uh, we're really going to see how many of these details we can decipher using a uh, more uh, elaborate MSMS spectra. And uh, as I said, I'm going to focus on the unsaturation limit uh, elements. Uh, we've also looked at uh, stereochemistry and regiochemistry, which I will not focus on as much uh, in this uh, seminar today. Now, getting back to collisional activation, it does great for certain things like uh, uh, Chain length and unsaturations overall can be determined. Uh, head groups uh, readily deciphered. It's the locations of those um, double bonds or other unsaturation motifs which are more difficult to discern as well as the uh, stereochemistry. And so to, to solve these more ch uh, greater structural challenges, there've been a number of strategies that have been developed and you might have, in, have tried some of these in your own labs or had other speakers talk about them, such as the Paterno-Bucci um, reactions, which are really being promoted by uh, 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 a group in, in China, Yu Shaw's group, uh, ozone-induced dissociation, which has been uh, really promoted by the Blanksby group, and then some of these others, uh, which have, um, are just still emerging and look very promising. And so ours that, that we're really going to focus on is the ultraviolet photodissociation. And when we think about this, in a nutshell, what we're actually doing is using a laser beam to um, dissect the lipid. So we're irradiating the lipids with photons from a laser to energize and then um, decompose the lipids. And hopefully that occurs in a meaningful and reproducible way and then we can derive um, insights into the structure and develop rules for interpreting the spectra. I just, I wanna give you uh, offhand right up front, what are some of the key performance features of ultraviolet photodissociation instead of using your more traditional collisional activation methods. Uh, as I'll show, there's some very rich fragmentation patterns. It can be used in both positive and negative modes, so that's great. Uh, can be used uh, over a range of charge states. And usually for lipids, we're looking at, you know, relatively low charge states, but this is more important for proteins where you can have a huge range in um, charge states. Uh, I won't talk about proteins, peptides, and nucleic acids, but it's also uh, quite useful for those other classes of molecules. And uh, because of the level of um, detail we can get in the fragmentation patterns, it really is useful for pinpointing sites of modifications or mutations in structures. So how do we do this? Um, well, we've implemented photo dissociation in a number of ion trapping mass spectrometers. And in fact, it is easiest to implement on an ion trap system, as opposed to a, a time of flight or a triple quad or other systems like that. 
Uh, but so here's a schematic showing the Orbitrap system. This happens to be a Lumos, but we have implemented it on um, QE systems, uh, older school elite systems, and so forth. Uh, we've got it on a UHMR too. Uh, but you know, we used a traditional electrospray to introduce our lipids. Then we can shuttle them to the back end where there's a couple of linear ion traps. That's great for capturing the lipids and holding them there while we array it with the laser. And so in our case, we've drilled a hole in the back of the mass spectrometer, added an optical window, and then we can introduce our laser. And so this is a, a blow up of one of those linear ion traps showing the lipid um, being trapped and oscillating and the laser beam can intersect those lipids. They'll absorb photons, um, become energized and dissociate. Our favorite laser is an excimer laser. Uh, that's filled with argon fluoride gas and that gas composition produces photons that are 193 nanometers in wavelength. That corresponds to um, almost six and a half electron volts per photon. So that's a lot of energy deposition per photon. And we could have multiple photons if um, you know, we use a higher power or multiple pulses. But each pulse is only five nanoseconds. So it can be accomplished very quickly and it's a high rep rate laser. Now for, for lipids, oftentimes uh, we're using multiple pulses and you know, three, four, five millijoules, something like that. Uh, so this can occur in about a 40 millisecond period. Um, now I will say that uh, Thermo has more recently launched um, an, an ultraviolet photo dissociation product that uses a 213 nanometer solid state laser. It's a very small laser. It fits right in the back of the cabinetry. And um, that can also be used for UV photo dissociation. It is a lower powered laser. Uh, but it has many of the features of, um, you know, the photo dissociation we would see with an excimer laser. And in fact, we have used both for, for lipid type studies. Okay, so just to give a, you know, an idea about the mechanism of um, this MSMS process, you know, if we have ions sitting in an energy well that have just been transferred to the mass spectrometer by electrospray, they're stable species, they don't necessarily fragment. But with the collisional activation, we will um, energize them by these stepwise collisions uh, that um, heat the molecule in vibrational modes and give fragmentation from uh, vibrational excitation. That's tr 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 traditional collisional activation. Now, UV photo dissociation is quite different because we have a much higher energy deposition per photon. And that means we can elevate ions into excited states and create a greater diversity of ions and fragmentation pathways. And so I'm gonna jump right in and show some spectra here just to orient you uh, with this photo association process. This is illustrated here for uh, phosphatidylcholine um, uh, with a single double bond just to illustrate the process. And we can get some uh, cleavages throughout this. I haven't um, shown all of them here, uh, but I wanted to show this enhanced region here where we see an unusual pair of ions at M over Z 622 and 646. Uh, you use ChemDraw to figure out what structures these are. It turns out that these are ions that bracket cleavage around the double bond. So it's cleavage of each carbon-carbon bond on either side of the double bond. And so it's an odd, unusual feature to see a difference of 24 Daltons. Um, but I'll show that on the next slide about how we think we generate those ions. Let's say we uh, cleave on this side of the double bond, this carbon-carbon bond. There is a hydrogen transfer that occurs across this double bond shifting a hydrogen to this little tail piece that gets lost as a neutral. And that leaves the remainder of the ion. Um, now we see it, it's like converted into a triple bond there um, and it's lost a hydrogen that's gone over to this side. Uh, so it's a, it's a stable species, it's still charged and this would be our ion at 646 in that pattern. Now I can also cleave at the other side of the double bond shown on this side. And in this case, again, we can get a hydrogen transfer across the double bond. 
and that little tail piece falls off. Now it's um, an, an unsaturated tail piece and the rest of the lipid structure is uh, still charged. That's what we see in the mass spectrometer. That would be at 622. And so um, this difference is actually 24 Daltons. And so it's an odd difference to see, but it's because we get that hydrogen shift that occurs with the cleavage. And so this feature is what we would use to localize the position of the double bond. And so the, here it is for another lipid um, showing, in fact, that feature delta 24 is now characteristic and we can look for that uh, when we're screening lipid spectra or looking for that feature. And so this is a case where um, now that the two lines would be 648 and 672. And of course we might have isomers, maybe we've got one um, lipid that has uh, the double bonds in the 6Z position, the other one in the 9Z position. Um, they have the same mass because they are isomers. And so um, many methods would identify them as uh, a phospholipid, it would even know that there's uh, two sites of unsaturation, but the double bonds could not be localized. And so um, Using the UVPD, in fact, we can localize those. Uh, for this one on the left, we see the characteristic ions at 628 and 652, shifted by the 24 Daltons. And the one on the right, we see the characteristic ions at 670 and 694, um, separated by 24 Daltons. So this one is characteristic of the 6Z isomer, and this one's characteristic of the 9Z isomer. Now, uh, notably, these features, these double bond features are pretty small. So if you're just looking, you know, glancing at spectra with the naked eye, in many cases, you're going to be very small ions. But fortunately, with an orbit trap, you have excellent signal noise. So even low abundance features can be um, magnified and, and seen with excellent signal noise and high confidence. In addition, with the high mass accuracy, high high mass accuracy, high resolution of the orbit trap, we can assign um, the molecular composition with very high confidence. Now, if we have uh, multiple double bonds, what happens then? Well, we also get cleavages on either side of each double bond. And so we would see patterns of each signature of the 24 Dalton um, difference. And so now we're getting more complicated spectra, but indeed we can look for those 24 Dalton features and assign the, the positions here at the 9Z and 12Z positions. And so this is just a little summary here. So basically we're looking for carbon-carbon cleavages that bracket each double bond. And if the double bond shifts, 9Z, 11Z, 6Z, the, the neutral losses that you would see would shift, and then you would see the corresponding um, signature ions in the mass spectra. And just let's review again what we see with conventional collisional activation. Uh, we often view collisional activation as an important um, screening tool. It's very complementary to UVPD. Uh, we would never um, say it's not useful. We, oftentimes we use them together in a study. Uh, the, the CID or HCD method is faster and it's great for screening uh, mixtures very quickly and looking for signatures of lipids that then can be um, you know, targeted for subsequent runs where we might use UVPD or alternating scans, HCD then UVPD. That's a very powerful method. But with, with collisional activation, you often see just a few dominant um, ions, uh, often ones where um, we see uh, acyl chain losses are very prominent in the HCD spectra, and we often see some um, cleavages of the head group. Um, they're very useful for identifying that you've got lipids in your mixture, and then we can go through with UVPD to pinpoint those double bonds. And so this is a case where this this lipid here that we saw one signature of with collisional activation was actually a mixture of two isomers that could not be distinguished based on mass alone, 
but by looking for those features, you could see we actually had uh, a nine um, uh, delta uh, lipid isomer mixed in with 11 delta isomer, because we saw both of the features of the double bonds uh, that were you know, invisible or silent by collisional activation alone. So of course, you can then apply this in a shotgun fashion. So many people enjoy um, the shotgun mode of lipid analysis, where you basically infuse the entire mixture and uh, pick out uh, individual features and collect MSMS data to try to uh, discern what's in your mixture. So it's basically uh, uh, avoiding any type of um, chromatographic separation, just infusing everything. And um, shown here, this is an MS1 spectrum for a, a liver extract that we were analyzing. And um, you, know, you can go through each of those molecular ions and then collect MSMS spectra to um, characterize it in more detail. And shown here, I've highlighted one at M over Z760, uh, which was targeted for UVPD and its spectrum shown here. And you can see um, it's a, a mix, mixture of uh, two isomers, um, uh, one with a nine uh, delta uh, double bond, the other with 11 delta. Now that's the, the, the upside or the downside of the shotgun method is that you, you're not separating isomers. So if they have the same mass, they're all gonna be fragmented at the same time. But fortunately, with the UVPD, we had the ability to, to indicate that there were two different isomers within that um, single molecular peak. And that can be the, then the advantage of doing a chromatographic separation if you wanted to uh, look more deeply into the mixtures and uh, separate different isomers. So that's what I'm now going to shift to and show a little bit more detail about um, where, in fact, uh, we you know like the, the shotgun strategy, but we really wanted to get a, a deeper analysis of the very complex mixtures. So we incorporated an LC separation step, and this uh, separation is nothing fancy. We do a typical microbore type separation. It's very common in many um, lipidomics routines, uh, and the you know the UVPD and CID are sufficiently fast that they can easily sample anything that's eluding in an LC time scale. Uh, so the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about some bacterial lipid extracts. Uh, we have a number of collaborators um, who are interested in the, the patterns of uh, lipids in bacteria. And uh, in particular, both the phospholipids as well as lipopolysaccharides, which I'll talk about later for gram negative bacteria. And they want to know how these lipid compositions are altered as they um, you know, look at different uh, growth states of the lipid of the bacteria, or they manipulate the bacteria in other ways. And so in this case, we've extracted the um, bacteria. We um, do the separation online with the UVPD and CID. Again, we often view them as complementary and then do very extensive data analysis. And in this particular study, we were interested in not only double bonds in these bacterial lipids, but also cyclic propane rings, which is another sort of pseudo um, unsaturation motif. And in fact, um, with cyclopropane rings, when those um, are subjected to ultraviolet photoassociation, you see a, a different type of signature. It's a delta 14 Dalton. Um, uh, pattern. Uh, so that's, you know, the, the typical double bond was the 24 Dalton um, pair of ions. With the cyclopropane features, it's a 14 Dalton uh, pair of ions. So you can look for that pattern. And in fact, um, they're very prominent in a lot of these um, bacteria. And in fact, in some cases, I think they're probably being overlooked because people aren't looking for these um, cyclopropane um, motifs. But just to share some results here, I don't want to go on these in too detail, but just uh, to show that we can do a lot of applications with these methods and apply it to a variety of different bacteria. This is a case where a graduate student, Molly Blevins, was very interested in determining the bacterial um, phospholipid compositions and wanted to you know, assess 
whether the locations of the unsaturations were changing for different types of bacteria and whether the distribution of double bonds to cyclopropane rings was changing. And so in this case, um, she looked at, you know, looks like a, a 10 or a dozen different types of bacteria and simply monitored um, the number of different unsaturated phospholipids. So, you know, she would find any from zero to 30, you know, um, lipids uh, that were unsaturated. And then um, looking at the different um, omega position um, used for this uh, double bond unsaturation. And in fact, most of them do have the, the omega-7. Omega-7 is when you're counting from the tail instead of from this um, you know, first carbon here. Uh, so omega-7 was by far the most prominent, uh, but you see that for some of these um, bacteria strains, you actually see different positions, the W6, the uh, omega-8 or the omega-9 also pop up. And then she used those same um, sets of bacteria to look for the unsaturation type in terms of whether it's a double bond, which is the DB in red, or the cyclopropane uh, ring in the tan color, or whether they have both within the lipids. And in fact, you see that uh, most of these um, bacteria have a combination of both. Uh, this Vibrio cholera was an interesting one because it you know, she had no evidence of any cyclopropane modifications within those lipids, but most of them have a combination of both, and some have um, both even within the same uh, individual lipids. And in terms of those cyclopropane uh, lipids, she uh, looked at in, in close detail, for example, E. coli extract and then mycobacterium tuberculosis extract, looking for those cyclopropane features. And when you start looking for them and specifically pinpointing them with this Delta 14 mass um, uh, signature, you can find all sorts of these cyclopropane modifications in um, all types of different phospholipids based on their head group and uh, the, the different types of um, a class of mycolic acids. So these are really prominent and it's a feature that I don't know if it's always um, really fully monitored, but sometimes with these analytical methods, we find that when you do have a new analytical method that showcases features, then people recognize that those features might be important and now there's a way to actually study them. And so we can go back and extend the biological studies once the analytical te technology has advanced to that stage. I'm going to also focus on some uh, other types of lipids just to show that we can also use the UV photo dissociation patterns to look for other classes of lipids. And again, this is going to be incorporated in LCMS workflow. So we can look at fairly complex uh, mixtures and also get fairly deep um, coverage of these different types of lipids. And in particular, this was a study that um, a uh, grad student was interested in for these ether-linked lipids. And I was not really familiar with ether-linked lipids extensively until she uh, pursued this study, but she was pr particularly interested in their importance in peroxisomal diseases. And um, just to show these for those out there who are not familiar with um, these ether lipids, that this one on the uh, left is uh, uh, you know, what you would consider an ether lipid, look at that unusual linkage there, often known as plasmanol um, lipids. And the one on the right is a vinyl ether lipid. So it still has the ether signature, but now a double bond adjacent to it. Those are often called plasminol or plasmologen type lipids. Maybe you're familiar with those terms. And in this study, the graduate student was particularly interested in um, using the 213 nanometer UVPD that is the commercial product on the um, Orbitrap system. So, um, you know, we could easily do the 193 nanometer using our favorite Exmer laser, but uh, we also had access to the 213 um, nanometer type laser. So in this case, she was doing the, you know, tissue extraction, a, a traditional a reverse phase um, LC separation, 
samples going into the orbit trap that's equipped with uh, both HCD and 213 nanometer UVB, UVPD capabilities. She was looking at cerebellum and hippocampus samples and then a variety of other um, tissues from, from mice. Um, it, she would screen the samples using HCD. And we have found that over and over again that some sort of collisional activation is a great screening tool to pre-assess the, the lipid content in the samples. Um, then some data analysis to classify and categorize the lipids, then go and do targeted runs to look at specific lipids of interest using the UVPD. And then uh, she was also doing the quantitation with the UVPD. And I'll cut straight to the chase with these results here. Again, she was looking for the plasmanol phospholipids and the plasminol lipids. And um, she was particularly interested in um, these peroxisome biogenesis disorders, they include diseases like the Zellweger spectrum disorder and rhizosomal chondrose dysplasia punctata. I'm not familiar with those diseases, but we had some great collaborators who were very interested in these um, peroxisome disorders and had uh, uh, mice with, um, uh, that could exhibit these traits. And so in this case, she was looking at this is just one set of the tissues where she was looking at the hippocampus from the mice. She had the control mice versus the, uh, the disease mice with the peroxisome disorder. And just monitoring a whole bunch of these uh, plasmanol and plasminol lipids and looking for the relative abundances in the, in the tissue states. And you can see across the board in this um, case that the um, control mice have much higher um, uh, levels of these um, uh, lipids, either e these ether lipids compared to the peroxisomal um, mice. So this was a, a study where she used the UVPD to monitor the double bond locations and uh, then do the quantitation at the same time. And so um, this was a really nice example of using the, the UVPD to help localize those double bonds in those ether type lipids. Now I'm gonna study, uh, switch to yet another type of strategy. This is another quantitative workflow flow, again, using a combination of the collisional activation as in terms of HCD, and then uh, UVPD for parallel reaction monitoring. And so in this case, the uh, HCD was used to pre-screen uh, the lipids and develop uh, the transitions uh, for the acyl chains, uh, then refine the list to um, select ones that could be targeted for UVPD. And oftentimes we don't necessarily um, do UVPD on all the lipids. Maybe we're particularly targeting a subset of, of interest. And in this case, there were some phosphatidylcholines of, of particular interest for uh, this uh, comparison of normal tissue and uh, tumor tissue uh, in breast cancer uh, samples. And so it's uh, uh, the parallel reaction monitoring, which is well adapted for triple quad um, workflows, very often used for quantitation. We wanted to adapt it to UVPD on the orbit trap. And so the UVPD could actually look for transitions corresponding to the particular double bonds based on those delta 24 Dalton um, mass shifts. And uh, just cutting straight to the chase here, um, this is a case where uh, in particular, we were looking at uh, breast cancers, breast tumor samples. They were ones that were classified as progesterone receptor negative, estrogen receptor negative, uh, human epidural uh, growth factor receptive to negative versus uh, uh, normal uh, tissues. And the student in this case was looking at a variety of these um, phosphatidylcholines with different positions and types of unsaturations, different numbers of unsaturations, ranging from a couple to many, and um, looking at the different levels in the normal versus tumor samples. And I know there's a lot of bars here. You can kind of look at normal blue, red is tumor, but some of the main takeaways was the um, notable increase on in the uh, 1616 delta and 1818 um, delta uh, in the breast tumor cells, which 
likely correlates with the greater activity of the fatty acid desaturase 2 enzyme. And overall, the increase of the omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in the breast cancer, a breast tumor samples. So that was a very interesting outcome that really capitalized on this ability to do fast screening with the um, parallel reaction monitoring and hone in on those very double bond specific features that are um, uh, highlighted with uh, ultraviolet photo dissociation. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears again. Uh, you know, I really like the analytical technology, so we're always trying to adapt it to new workflows. So um, we teamed up with uh, Dr. Livia Eberlin, and maybe she's already given a seminar to, to this uh, metabolomics group, uh, but she has been a great collaborator and a superstar in the field for developing imaging mass spectrometry and more recently the mass spec pen. Um, and when Livia was here at University of Texas, uh, we teamed up because she had her great DESI imaging method, uh, but she couldn't always discern double bond patterns. And we had our nice UVPD method where we could discern double bond patterns. So we thought we would merge the methods and combine the DESI imaging with the UVPD. And, and this can easily be implemented on the Orbitrap platform. You just um, put the DESI source on the front end of the Orbitrap mass spectrometer, our lasers on the back end of the mass spectrometer, and it's a, it's a perfect unification. And so these are the, some of the grad students in the Eberlin group that contributed, and um, my grad student who was um, handling the UVPD was uh, Dustin Klein. And so in this particular, I'm going to show a few examples um, how it was utilized to examine brain tissue. And they're, of course, um, well known that uh, lipid distributions can change in different parts of the brain tissue. These were mouse brains. And so, you know, here's a, a typical DESI mass spectrum showing lots of features that correspond to, to lipids. Um, and you don't always naturally do MSMS with DESI because you're rapidly profiling across a lot of tissue and you can often simply use the accurate masses to identify key features of interest. But we really wanted to look at the double bond um, uh, characterization. So that's where we would do um, UVPD on each of these features uh, when we you know, looked at them across the tissue. Now, um, we uh, had to create a, an adapter for the DESI source because it was not outfitted for a LUMO system but that was uh, easy to accomplish and it was a nice little um, uh, adaptation. And then start team to look for these different lipids signatures in the uh, slice of the brain tissue. And you can see even just based on molecular mass, there's definite um, variations in where those lipids are localized. And so this isn't even looking at double bond localization. This is just looking at the lipids based on their intact masses. And uh, then, you know, you could use collisional activation to look at the fragmentation pattern. And there again, you're mainly going to get um, acyl chain cleavages and um, head group information. But even if you look closely at this region where we would anticipate the double bond information would be, it's simply not there. Uh, but if we do UVPD of the same um, uh, molecular ion, then you, you can amplify these features and see those, again, same 24 delta um, mass shifts that correspond to those ions that bracket the double bonds. So where HCD was able to determine that this was a, a phosphatidylcholine um, with a single double bond, it could not determine where the double bond was located. But the feature here, the 660, 684 in this pattern could tell that the double bond was located in this position. And it was a mixture with the double bond um, for the 688-712 ions that localized it to the 11 delta position. And so um, this lipid composition was actually a mixture of the two uh, lipids that uh, could be differentiated using the UVPD. And, um, you know, if you look at, um, 
that, you know, just a precursor, we already saw that a single lipid has quite a, a unique profile across the, the brain tissue. That's because it's a mixture of gray matter and white, white matter, which would have di different compositions of lipids. And in fact, now we can actually look with double bond uh, resolution, how those lipids are localizing. And for example, we see that um, the, the ratio of the uh, nine delta isomer to the 11 delta isomer changes in the white matter to the gray matter. And now you can determine that using the UVPD. I don't need to show these. I mean, you can look at individual lipids based on their double bond assignment and see how those lo localize. So, you know, this DESI is great for uh, creating these really nice uh, color-coded maps showing the spatial localization of these lipids. Uh, we've all seen that with DESI and, and, and MALDI imaging, and it's a, a truly a, a wonderful feature of those imaging methods. But if you look at the ratio of those two dip, uh, double bond isomers, you can see that it, it does vary. So this is a plot. This is a color-coded plot showing the ratio of one of the uh, double bond isomers, the nine delta, to the other, the 11 delta. And you can see um, the pattern changes across the lipids. Uh, across the tissue. And it, it sort of corresponds with some of the, the white matter, gray matter differentiation. And I'm not great at reading these tissues, but um, it's, a, it's a, a new detail that can be tweezed out that may um, uh, you know, reveal more information about um, what's going on in the brain tissue, especially in, in disease states. I'll, I'll pass over that one. I've got two little segments left to to talk about. So I think I'll uh, hustle along here and try to get each through each of these. Um, one is related to cardiolipins. I mentioned that earlier on, and I just want to give a shout out to this because these are a more challenging type of lipid. They have four acyl chains, and that can really deter uh, determination of double bond positions and uh, many other features of these. Uh, but they are incredibly important um, in um, mitochondrial membrane structure, and they've also been associated with uh, certain disease states. Um, but because of their challenging structures, they're, you know, they're often not uh, featured in uh, certain types of studies. And so in this case, because these are complicated with four different chains, we knew we needed an elevated MSMS -MS strategy. So we actually went to an MS to the third strategy uh, because we knew that we could break off some of those acyl chains to simplify the lipids and then use UVPD to localize the double bonds. So this is a case where collisional activation was truly our friend because collisional activation is great at cleaving individual acyl chains from these lipids. So for example, for this uh, cardiolipin, um, this uh, cleavage here of this acyl chain gives a prominent uh, ion at 1173 that can be interrogated su subsequently with UVPD. And um, we can also see that the individual chains cleave off and give these uh, low mass ions. Uh, but this is very characteristic of the collisional activation and allows us, sets us up nicely for an MS and third strategy. So the second step would be to take that a uh, prominent ion, fragment ion from the previous spectrum, and then use, do UVPD solely on that ion. And so for example, here was the 1173 from that previous spectrum was then selected for UVPD as illustrated here in the lower right. And in this case, again, we see those features separated by 24 Daltons, which pinpoint the double bond location. And that uh, corresponds to uh, this position here and a localization of the double bond. Uh, again, this can be Im implemented in um, a shotgun fashion or a, an LCMS fashion, whichever you prefer. This is demonstrated for E. coli extract, lots of lipids in E. coli. Uh, uh, many of them are cardiolipins. Um, you can determine that the you have these big cardiolipins with you know, multiple sites of unsaturation. Um, the CID will allow you to break off those chains, and then you can go in 
uh, with UVPD to try to localize uh, the, the double bonds. So CID gives you lots of information about this, um, you know, the kind of the right-hand portion of the cardiolipin because um, it's breaking these acyl chains. Uh, but the, I've grayed out the region where the chains are because we just don't know what features are there based on the collisional activation pattern. But for example, if we break off this chain at, um, and form an ion at mass to charge 1119, we can go and target it for UVPD. If we break off this chain at 1131, we can target it for UVPD. And so it's a little, it takes a little more work to go through each site and um, break the chain and then uh, do UVPD, but uh, then we can pinpoint the double bonds. Um, and so in this case, um, the, again, the, any time you see the signature of Delta 24, it's a double bond being located, but turns out that this cardiolipin also had the Delta 14. Remember, I talked about that earlier, that's a cyclopropane motif. And so, uh, you know, looking at this, these three chains, we were able to localize the cyclopropane ring here, um, localize the double bonds, and then we can put the whole thing together and reconstruct the entire lipid. And this would be the entire structure reconstructed by looking at chopping off each chain individually and looking at the remainder of the structure. And so this was one of our favorites because it contained both types of, um, you know, unusual unsaturation type motifs. And um, it was a nice illustration of an MS the third strategy. So finally, I'm going to uh, end with just a short segment. I've just got a couple of minutes left. So I'm just going to talk about uh, the most challenging of all, in my opinion, are these lipopolysaccharides. This is, in fact, how we really got started with lipids, was a collaborator who was really struggling with these uh, large lipids on the outer membrane of um, gram-negative bacteria. And uh, these have a lipid A core structure, and then they have lots of uh, sugars attached to them. And so they're very challenging. And I've already talked about phospholipid um, analysis, but what about these? And these are in fact, uh, you know, really important for um, contributing to antibiotic resistance. So knowing these structures uh, can really be important for developing new antibiotics and understanding their mechanisms of resistance. So I'm gonna use this little color-coded uh, cartoon type structure for these polysaccharide lipid A combinations, they're very complicated. So instead of rewriting all of this, I'm gonna show the shorthand notation for the lipid A, which is this portion where we actually have the lipid. And then this big portion where we have the sugars are gonna use the color-coded symbols for all the different sugars that might be attached to those um, lipid A structures. And so here's a you know, shotgun analysis. We infuse uh, the lipids from this particular gram-negative bacteria. We see a bunch of different ions. These now are multi-charged ions because these are much larger lipids. And if you deconvolute the spectrum, you would see that these lipids actually have masses in the several thousand Dalton range or higher. So um, you know, these are uh, larger lipids and um, we're gonna take these from the shotgun analysis and subject them to UVPD. Now this is a case where UVPD works a little bit against you because when you do UVPD of a large lipopolysaccharide like this, you have a very complicated MSMS -MS spectrum. And uh, it's very difficult to decipher what all these ions are, where they're coming from. Your, your students are spending hours and hours on ChemDraw trying to draw structures that exactly match the masses. It's very tedious. So we knew we needed to improve this workflow. We needed to decongest these spectra. And this is a case where again, MS to the third comes to the rescue. And again, collisional activation is truly our friend because collisional activation of these large lipids gives a very simple cleavage. Uh, it bisects the lipopolysaccharide. And so CID gives a lipid A type structure and a polysaccharide type structure. Those are the two prominent ions. And then we can go in with UVPD and interrogate each one and then piece it back together for the original intact structure. 
So it's, a, it's an MS3 workflow. So this is an example. Here's the color cartoon of a lipopolysaccharide. We isolate the four minus charge state, subject it to CID. We see this big red ion, which is the lipid A portion. We see the big green ion, which is the polysaccharide portion. Each of those are very abundant, well suited to go in with UVPD, just based on cleavage of that um, glycosidic bond. So then we do UVPD on each of the two substructures. We still get complicated patterns, but now they're manageable because we know from the red portion, all those ions must be coming from the lipid A side of it. From the green portion, all those ions must be coming from the, the oligosaccharide portion. So it really helps streamline the data analysis when you know where your ions are evolving from. And so we can put all this back together. And there we have the intact structure through a nice MS the third workflow. So again, uh, the combo of the CID followed by UVPD was the most extensive characterization. Okay, so I think I've shown a lot of examples of this analytical method at work. I've maybe covered too much, but I just wanted to throw it out there because I think um, it's a great tool moving forward and uh, maybe it will spur some more collaborations. And you know, our dream ultimately is we've developed this tool that not only can we look at phospholipids, but we can look at lipopolysaccharides. And you know, if we're gonna be looking at uh, mixtures, we could just dig in and look at the proteins at the same time. And UVPD could be like a one size fits all for analyzing all these types of molecules. So rather than extensive conclusions, I just wanna say you know, about UVPD, the good and the bad. You know, the best feature about UVPD is we get these rich fragmentation patterns. The worst feature, we get the rich fragmentation patterns. So it really takes a lot of data analysis and uh, a lot of manual um, using ChemDraw to, to come up with ions and fit those um, fragmentation patterns. And so we definitely need more uh, lipid analysis tools to help with this workflow. But fortunately, the data is all there. We just need to you know, mine through it and um, you know, come up with some great discoveries. And so finally, I just want to acknowledge all the great grad students who've contributed to this work over the years, innovating ideas and trying to dig through this data and, and come up with these features. Uh, also funding sources for all their um, uh, great support over the years. And a big, huge shout out to collaborators, because I'll reemphasize we're not a biology group, not a biochem group, not a microbiology group. So we really rely on collaborators to help guide us with problems. Um, identify features that we didn't even know were important, uh, and then we can put our analytical chemistry to work. So I think I'll stop there and um, hopefully you maybe have some questions. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, we do like uh, fragments. Um, so <laughs> I think it's, it's good to have fragments in mass spectrometry. Um, so as usual, uh, Dr. Arpana Vinia will now guide us through the Q&A questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Broadbelt. That was a great talk. I learned so much. I know this was a practice talk, but I think it was really great. We have so many questions in different categories and they're still coming in. So let's jump right into it. Um, kind of focusing around HCD versus UVPD and like UVPD in general questions. The first one asks, I wonder if we ignore the abundant fragments in HCD spectra, would the low abundant fragments already tell us more about lipid structures? That is a great uh, question. And you know, I've, I've asked my students, I said, please go back and look, amplify those regions over and over and over again to see if you can find some of the ions and they don't consistently find double bond um, signature ions. So. I think it could be a truly unique feature of using the high energy laser to generate those cleavages. Um, we are trying to, we've got a couple ideas about how we could um, alleviate some of the overly abundant HCD ions and even dig deeper into the, the HCD spectra, but we have not yet uncovered them um, yet. Great, thank you. We're looking forward to you know, hearing about it when you do uncover them. Um, there are 
spectra that you showed with M plus H or M plus NA precursor ions. In both cases, the molecular adduct species were still pretty abundant. Would UVPD work better for specific addicts than others? Uh, is there a way to induce more fragmentation or higher abundant fragment ions? That is a great question. And that is another, the elephant in, the other elephant in the room is um, UVPD for lipids is pretty low efficiency. Um, and, you know, that's why oftentimes I, I talk about proteins because proteins have an amide chromophore which is a very good match for 193 nanometer photons. And so you get much higher efficiency with proteins. But lipids, you're looking at the lipid structure, trying to figure out what is a good chromophore. And um, I can assure you that all those alkyl type chains are not good chromophores for UVPD. So you really need a feature like maybe a double bond absorbs a little bit, maybe you get a little absorption from the carbonyl. Uh, but they just don't absorb well. So the efficiencies are low. And so even if we use multiple pulses and try to raise our energy, we don't ever really truly erode the, the precursor ion. And it's only the grace of the Orbitrap with its excellent signal to noise that in some cases we can see those fragment ions and the signal to noise is still very good. So we're still confident. Um, but they are small. So oftentimes we have to amplify them by a factor of 10, 50, even 100 um, for the UVPD spectra. Uh, so we don't try to hide it, but it is um, uh, something we wish we could amplify. But I think using the 193 laser, it's about the best we're gonna do. Now we have not found a better laser that's better fit that still gives those double bond fragments. So we're gonna stick with 193 nanometer. Now the 213 also will generate those fragment ions, but you have to use a very long um, activation period, probably a second um, to, to try to generate enough of those fragment ions to see the double bonds. So any of you who have the, um, the Eclipse or the Lumos equipped with the 213 nanometer UVPD and you wanna do lipids, make sure you use a very long activation time one second in many cases in order to generate those fragment ions. If you use a short little period like 10 or 20 milliseconds, like you might use for collisional activation or uh, you won't see them. And so you'll think it's not working, I'm not seeing them, but they're there, they just need a long activation period. So that was kind of a long-winded answer, but um, I think that addresses the efficiency and in fact, you can look at sodium adducts or ammonium adducts. A lot of times we do that uh, to try to fit the lipids, depending on whether we're looking in positive, negative mode. We know that different lipids ionize in different, you know, the negative mode preferentially or positive mode. And sometimes we're flipping back and forth and we're trying to, um, you know, maximize the number of lipids in both um, polarities. Great. I, th I think that was uh, wonderful and, and, you know, a good tip for, for new users uh, on that thermo instrument. Um, sticking to um, addicts on slide 10 or one of the slides, um, it looks like you had different segments of molecules associated with either potassium or sodium addicts. Do you find certain addicts consistently give you specific pieces of structural information? No, we have not found that. I mean, you know, sometimes the lipids just show up as sodium addicts or potassium addicts. And so we go with that because that might be more prominent, but it, it's not necessarily ideal. I mean, ideally we would uh, eliminate a lot of those adducts and not have such a distribution of different um, molecular ion types. And in one of the studies I didn't have time to talk about, my, my student you know, with the cardiolipins, he, um, actually methylated them uh, using the trimethyl disilane um, chemistry to methylate them to cut down on the number of different adducts you get with all those phosphate groups attaching different um, numbers of lithiums or sodiums. It really becomes a mess. Mm -hmm. So by methylating them, you can really cut down on some of that adduction. Uh, so that's a nice strategy if you don't mind another step in your workflow using methylation. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, one last question on addicts. Does UVPD have a preference in types of addicts for lipids? 
or if they prefer the negative mode over you know positive ionization mode does the lipid class or the position of the double bond affect the percent yield of the product ions or or to see that difference of uh, 24 that you mentioned right no we have not seen that we've seen that 24 delta um, 24 Dalton uh, mass difference in positive mode, negative mode. We've seen it with um, some sodium ions, uh, protonated species, deprotonated, et cetera. It seems to be pretty consistent a feature. Um, so uh, it's you know, across the board, you can see it. And the, the only reason I've, I've shown all these different types of ions is sometimes that's what we generate. And as I said, it, it creates heterogeneity that might not be favorable, but um, you know, we just kind of analyze what we can see. Okay, um, in, in kind of switching gears here, um, in question to method development of targeted UVPD analysis, how long does that usually take to add such a method in terms of method development? Oh, well, you know, I think, um, it can it can actually be done in, in a few you know days of working with the lipids. So I would say it's not a major uh, addition. You know, after you've been working with all your standards and doing all these replicates and everything, I don't think it's a, a huge addition. And in some cases, you can do the targeted methods in the same runs. So it's not like you have to do an entirely different set of runs. You could just incorporate it into the single run workflow that you're doing. So I think it's a very feasible to develop. And if it, um, if it ultimately streamlines your data analysis, I think my students would say that the, the biggest time sink for them is the after, um, after data collection data processing. Oh, that's uh, perfect. Going through the spectra, interpreting the spectra, it's a lot of manual analysis. So actually running the LC runs and doing the, you know, the targeted runs that's pretty streamlined and you can set that up and let it run. But then the, the data processing, that's the slow part because it requires human eyes constantly looking at the data and it's not automated. Yeah, you read my mind. That's the exact same question I was going to ask. Next is what tools or software do you use to process UVPD, UVPD data? And is it handled differently than the HCD CID data? Um, I know you kind of, you just said that a lot of it's handled manually, but are there any tools or software that you would recommend? Well, we, you know, for, for some of the standard screening, we use the great tools that are already out there. Um, so there are some great programs that adapt well with collisional activation or even, you know, MS1 screening that are superb programs. When it comes to UVPD, um, I had a postdoc develop a program that we hope um, will show up in his next paper. We, we called it UV Puff, but it's uh, like UV, I can't remember what the acronym means. It's like photo dissociation for um, unsaturation analysis. Um, so we have developed something in-house that definitely streamlines looking for those, um, you know, 24 Dalton shifts or the 14 Dalton shifts, but that's just a, a little tool we in, developed in-house it's not professionally done, and um, I don't know that it's ready for prime time. Although, you know, we're always happy to share it. Great. Um, there's a, another question here. Outside of lipids and proteins and peptides, have you found any small molecule functional groups that tend to respond strongly to UVPD fragmentation? You know, it seems like anything with um, sites of unsaturation is, you know, a pretty good type of target. So that any kind of small molecule that has that is, you know, is always a candidate for analysis. Um, uh, sometimes we can get uh, disulfide bond cleavages. So if those show up in any of your small molecules, that might be something to, to look at. Um, but those are probably the things that come to mind. Great. Um, now, kind of moving towards um, the lipid A that you spoke about, what reason, what was the reason for choosing shotgun, oh, was the reason for choosing shotgun to prolong UVPD activation time? What's the activation time used on the plasmologens and lipid A, for example? Okay, those are all about the same. 
if we're using our 193 nanometer laser, uh, we can typically use from five to eight pulses. And there's a pulse every two milliseconds. So overall, that activation period would be a total activation period of 10 to 20 milliseconds. It's not as fast as HCD, which can be less than one millisecond, but 10 to 20 millisecond is still pretty fast, works fine with either shotgun analysis or LCMS. Now, the, the only time it takes, it gets pretty long is if you use the 213 nanometer UVPD, that's probably gonna take about a second, uh, you know, 500 milliseconds to a second. So that, that slows things down a little bit, but um, you know, uh, in terms of phospholipids versus uh, lipopolysaccharides, uh, those are have about the same activation periods. Great, thank you. And and for sticking with lipid A, uh, for the elucidation of lipid A, could you elaborate what's the extra fragments by UVPD than CID? Oh yeah. Well, you know, a lipid A portion has those long acyl chains and you can get a fair amount of fragmentation uh, of those acyl chains. Uh, you can also get some cross ring cleavages of the, the, the two sugars that hold the lipid A together. You can get some cross ring cleavages there. So that may or may not help you determine the, the number of acyl chains on each of those two connected. Maybe I can pull back to that structure of that in a second. Oh yeah, here you, here you can see there's two sugars that are connected and they can have different numbers of acyl chains on each, um, each of those two rings. And so if you can cleave between them or do cross link cleavages that are unique to UVPD, you can help determine the number of acyl chains on each side of that uh, two uh, sugar ring. So that's one thing, those are some of the extra fragments that you can get with the UVPD that you would typically not see with um, uh, CID. Great, thank you. Um, and now switching gears to uh, different fragmentation mechanisms because there, there have come out, you know, with some few newer modes of uh, fragmentation like EAD, have you looked at combining modes of fragmentation to find new mechanisms, perhaps similar to what you've shown with EAD CID or found anything else that might be useful? Yeah, you know, um, you know, as you see with, with each new analytical method, you kind of grow attached to it and you become familiar with it. And so we, we don't have experience with like the ozone or Oz ID we don't have real experience with the paternity Bucho methods. So we just really haven't delved into those much. And a lot of times when you try them the first time, they're a flop and you think, oh my gosh, this is never gonna work. And it's, it's not worth my time. And it takes magic to get it to work. And so, you know, your students give up in frustration or whatever. Uh, that's, that's pretty common with any new technique. And so um, since UVPD has been working, and since the collisional activation is also very um, easy to implement, those have been our two favorites by far. And you know we've also got access to electron um, uh, activation methods like ETD and ECD. And you know for a lot of these lipids that analyze uh, or uh, ionize in the negative mode preferentially, those electron-based methods aren't useful anyway because they're you know for positive type ions. So we've kind of ignored or overlooked the electron activation methods. And so that kind of has winnowed us down to just the mainly collisional activation and mainly UVPD. Um, but I think there's you know, other groups that potentially could start combining methods and maybe, maybe they would stumble on some new MS the third strategies or combo strategies that could even be better and more powerful than anything. Yeah, there's always room for more information, especially yeah. with all the new technology that comes out. So we've covered a lot of questions on UVPD and, and fragmentation mechanisms. Um, I wanted to switch gear he, switch gears here and, and ask a question specifically about identification of double bonds, since that is you know, the big takeaway here with your, your methodology. Um, when investigating a full extract like liver, how many unusual double bond positions would you find? 
you exemplified cis six besides cis nine for C18-1, but how frequent are such findings? Meaning how often do we overlook these presumably lower abundant fatty acid contributions? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And you know we have not done a super extensive, super deep look at everything. Um, you know, so it's something we could go back to do, but we, at the same time, we don't want to, you know, just, you know, randomly uncover new stuff that won't be exciting to other people. So that's why um, we always are, you know, looking out for new collaborators who might actually have a hypothesis that, you know, they're, they think there might be some double bonds that are really important and they don't know how to get uh, you know, find them, or maybe they're really interested in the other types of motifs like the cyclopropanes and things, and that would really help guide us. And so that's where I think maybe, you know, we fall short, short a little bit because we can do some digging and tracking, but then we need to come up with an exciting story or make people take note. And um, so we, we probably haven't dug as deeply as we should or could, um, and maybe uh, a student down the road will really find that compelling and want to jump into that and do an even more extensive and, and deeper dive. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, besides PC double bond isomers, do you also find SN isomers played a differential role in your disease models? And kind of switching to the application. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be true. Uh, uh, again, I will say um, my depth of understanding of the mechanisms of the disease or the features of the disease are pretty uh, uh, superficial, to be honest. So I don't want to make too many um, judgments or predictions, uh, uh, but that's something that is definitely on the horizon is to, you know, to work with collaborators as we are doing and really figure out if we can develop a model and then test it. You know, now that we've got the technology in hand, can we look at different disease states or disease versus normal or different types of tissues and actually figure out if there is a true impact going on? Great. In, in general, do you see different types of signatures in conjugated polyunsaturated lipids? Uh, you know, we usually see the same things, you know, lots of the uh, uh, 24 Dalton, um, you know, pairs uh, prominent throughout the spectrum, for example. Uh, some of them become very low abundant, so you, you don't always see the full pair, so it's a little hazy, but uh, all of those would be possible. And we actually have a collaborator now with um, someone who's gener generated some highly polyunsaturated species that we're starting to examine now. So that will be exciting. And the, the, the upside of those is that because there's so many sites of unsaturation, they actually have slightly higher UVPD efficiencies hmm. because you know, obviously that serves as a chromophore. So um, we, we gain a little bit more in the efficiency department and hopefully now we can actually figure out what's going on with all those um, many sites of unsaturation. Great. Um, you had spoke. You had spoken about Desi UVPD. What is the resolution in micrometers for the Desi? Okay, I think it. I um, had to. Hold, I'm thinking it was maybe a hundred to two hundred microns. That was my my gut feeling. It could be off on a, lot, a little bit. It's not nearly as good as Maldi, or not mm -hmm. as good as Maldi. Um, but uh, so you know. To terms, in terms of how much spatial resolution, I think they're trying to you know, improve that using you know, nano-based methods and other things for the DESI, but it's, it can't rival MALDI at this point. So we, we don't really get you know, single cell type resolution or anything like that yet. Gotcha. Um, there's a really great question here. Would you imagine the ion mobility will reach a comparable extent of structural elucidation as UVBD? I think eye mobility is a great, um, great add-on method to further, you know, sort out some of these overlapping lipids. Uh, we've actually developed a drift tube. Uh, you know, eye mobility, you don't always think about it with orbitraps because the, the time scale is very different. 
So ion mobility is a much better match for very fast, tough, tough time of flight systems. But uh, we've developed a drift tube with um, Fourier transform multiplexing that can help track um, lipids based on their uh, fragmentation profiles. So that's a pretty complicated method, but it shows promise for adding another layer of how we can sort out lipids based on mobility and fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. Um, we've already seen the big impact eye mobility has with lipid mixtures and combining it with EVPD seems like a, a nice uh, future direction. Yeah, I mean, orthogonal information is just gonna drive up that confidence um, much more. I, there's a question here, which would be, which is really good for people who are starting out in mass spectrometry or maybe lipidomics. You specifically spoke about the Orbi trap system, but are there other types of instruments that could be used for dissociations of lipidomics or, or lipids in lipidomic studies that, you know, well, you know, might not have UPD, UVPD, but definitely has CID that you would recommend? I think, I think a lot of people have done um, some lipidomics with uh, triple quads. You know, they're great for parallel reaction monitoring and, and uh, fast and robust systems. And QTOFs are uh, awesome systems for doing this type of um, lipidomic work. So that's been also a very uh, big player in the field. And there's quite a few ion mobility systems already integrated with um, QTOF systems. So that makes it an extra bonus for people going down the uh, QTOF um, road. And mm -hmm. so I think those are uh, you know, great alternatives uh, that would offer similar types of information. And so we would just have to get um, UVPD integrated there if you really wanted that type of feature. Great. Um, and last couple questions here on the thermal laser versus the eczema laser, which you use, you mentioned that the solid state laser um, that is commercially available offers in comparison to your research grade laser. Have you found that fragmentation mechanisms are similar for small molecules? The yields are just lower coming from a lower power solid state laser compared to the eczema laser. Yes, I, I think uh, in many, many cases, the fragmentation pathways are similar. And um, we're still doing lots of comparisons. But in many cases, the 213 nanometer UVPD could be used as an alternative to 193 nanometer UVPD. And um, so there's many, many similarities. And I will say that that 213 nanometer UVPD laser is, is small, it's compact, it's quite robust. So there are many things working in its favor. Um, you know, since we do custom modification, we have these, you know, kind of big lasers and laser shields hanging off the back of our orbit traps, but that's not the best setup for every lab. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely see that the, um, the niche of the 213 nanometer UVPD, and we're trying to adapt it for more um, applications in our own lab. And it's especially in the, in the, in the protein analysis world where it actually uh, works quite well for uh, analysis of intact proteins. Okay, um, and maybe you went over this, but are they complementary in terms of the information or the information is completely different between the two wavelengths? I think the information is pretty similar. Okay. So I, you know, you wouldn't necessarily do an entire study with each of them back to back, you'd get a lot of redundancy. So okay. I would say, you know, you might optimize a few experiments with each one and then choose one or the other and just stick with it. But I, I don't see a, a driving force to use both uh, for an entire study. So outside of 193 and or 213 nanometer lasers, do you know of, or do you think there will be different fragmentation pattern changes with different wavelengths? I think there could be. I think there could be, and you know, you know, the infrared lasers have been integrated with FTICR systems, mm -hmm. and so you know, infrared is lasers are much more comparable to the things you get with collisional activation. So that might be, you know, just a, a replacement, not necessarily a, a lot of new insight there. But there's a whole lot of other lasers, you know, in the visible range uh, that 
or, or are different ranges of the UV uh, um, spectrum that could be suitable. Um, it's just a matter of taking the time and investment to get one of those lasers, set it up, test it out. Mm -hmm. um, we've done a little bit of that with the YAG laser, which has a few wavelengths. But, um, you know, oftentimes when you have something that's working well, you, you tend to stick with it and continue to push that forward rather than branch into too many other areas. And so we simply have not had the, um, the manpower to, to explore a whole lot of other lasers. Great. Yeah. There's actually just one question that popped up right now about if there is any space for bringing back IR laser for fragmentation. And I, I guess with what you're saying is there could be, but it just takes time. Yeah, I think there definitely is. And, you know, something we talk about quite a bit because we already have a couple of IR lasers that we started using years ago and then we you know, set aside, but uh, infrared lasers are, are a great way to heat molecules. And it could be that combining an infrared laser with a UV laser, you might um, break up some molecules that simply aren't um, disassembling in the, in the mass spectrometer. So having a little extra heat from the infrared laser or it might break some other parts of the molecule. So I think there is some, uh, still some you know, opportunities there. Great, that is all the questions. There were so many questions. I thank everybody who <laughs> submitted questions and thank you, Dr. Broadbelt for answering all of them. Um, yeah, with that, if there are any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. I see Shen, she's unmuted herself. Yes. Uh... Hi, Dr. Brockbelt. I actually sent an email about my data. So if you have the time, I can show you. I do see your fragments, also my fragments. If I have the, like two minutes, can we stay behind to look into that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Wonderful. That's great. Um, so I guess what I'll do right now is just share a little bit about our next seminar that's coming up. And let me just share the screen here. Okay, so here we go, minimize. Um, next month on June 15th, we have Dr. Michelle L. Ray Rezar from Vanderbilt University coming to talk about MALDI imaging mass spectrometry for small molecule analysis. Dr. Rezar serves as the Associate Director of the Imaging Mass Spectrometry Core Facility and is also the Education Director for the National Research Research resource for imaging mass spectrometry. Wow, that was a, a long title. Um, I hope you guys, everyone can join. Um, we're looking forward to hearing her talk. And With that, thank, oh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Thanks again <laughs> to Professor Jennifer Broadbell to uh, devoting her time to, you know, assemble these uh, really interesting things about lipids and answering a lot of questions we had. Thank you so much. Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely. It was a delight. And thank you for motivating me to update my seminar and, and get it all together. I've enjoyed it. Okay. It was a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. All right. See you Thanks. next month. Okay. okay.